And the first thing I need to do today is, uh, before I get started, is clean up this palette a little bit. Uh, this is a palette that came with my, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Not Gorilla, the, the Soltec. This is a palette that came with my Soltec easel. And uh, I don't use it a ton with my Soltec easel. Um, I've modified it here. I'll show you real quickly. So I bought this easel. I, I glued and screwed these two boards into the easel with the back one raised up slightly, which gives me a little lip. Then I just simply ran a bead of hot glue along this pallet so it slips in like that and see it connects holds quite well so it's just a real quick uh way to hold my easel my my pallet onto the easel um as you know i paint with two hands so holding a pallet with one hand is not an option for me and so i'm always devising different methods by which i can uh, paint without holding a palette and yet have the palette right there in front of me. Anyway, so just cleaning it up, scraping. Um, you can't really, you can't really carve, you know, into this. It's too soft, but you can drag a razor, a straight razor along it and get it pretty clean. Uh, by the way, I, and I, I've mentioned this many times, but you, I, we have new people watching all the time. Um, I keep this, I keep all my palettes in the freezer. <laughs> my, my wife, my wife over the years has uh, become very patient with me. Every time she opens her freezer to get food out, she has to watch out because there's at least two paint palettes in there. And then every six, eight, ten months, whenever she uh, cleans out the freezer, she has to clean out little bits of paint that have gotten accidentally stuck to the frost hanging down from the shelf above. Are you, are you with me? You found me? <laughs> so, it's, she's been very gracious to me, for which I am thankful. Okay, so done perhaps now. Um, as you perhaps saw by the title there, I'm going to finish a painting that I started um, last Sunday. That's two days ago now. I did a, a a painting class. It was a five hour, is that right? Noon to five? It was a five hour long painting class. And uh, it was essentially my painting technique. My approach to painting was the, the theme. So it's acrylic underneath and oil on top. I do in fact have a photograph. Sorry for all that jerking around. But uh, there's my reference that I, I'm not going to use that very much. I don't, I don't need it at this point very much. Um, that's a picture that I took down in Charleston, South Carolina. Let me let you look at this painting straight on for just a minute. And I think you'll look better if I turn that light off. There you go. Yeah. Oh, it's still not very good, is it? Sorry about all that glare. Um... You see how much of that is glare? What happens if I turn that off? Oh, actually not bad. So there, there's the best look at it. Uh, the flag was added at the very last minute. I wanted to demonstrate for the students painting a flag, an American flag, I should say. And uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with where this painting is right now. Uh, so I, my, one of my, I want to finish it. One of my chief concerns is not to ruin it. <laughs> Don't ruin a good thing. Okay, let me turn my lights back on so I have light to work with. And I'm going to move you a little bit. And uh, let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is demonstrate. And I, I'm going to try to get in touch with all of my students from Sunday because we were really, my fault, we were really rushed at the end of the class, and they did not get a good, you know, how to finish the painting. They didn't get a good example of that. Uh, the other thing is that I, I'm happy to show all of you is how I approach 
day two on a painting. Of course, when I say day two, might be a couple days later, but the second day on a painting after all this is dry. Now, let me, let me point out something really quickly because this is really important. So this painting is only two days old and I want you to see right here, there's some really thick, like almost eighth of an inch thick impasto here. And it's rubbery. If this was regular titanium paint, that would be wet for a month at least before it got this dry. So I quit using regular titanium years ago. Now I only use, here's all that's left of this particular tube. I only use Alkyd, A-L-K-Y-D. That's not a brand. Griffin is the brand. Uh, Alkyd means they've added an alkaline dryer to the oil paint. So it's essentially oil paint. Now you may ask the question, well, if you want your titanium to dry fast, why don't you just use liquid like you do with all your other oil paints? The answer is because if you add liquid to your paint, it makes it more transparent. And the whole point of using white is you don't want transparent. White and transparent are is an oxymoron. In fact, there is a company, an acrylic company, that's, I don't know which one, they'll remain unnamed, that sells a tube of, quote unquote, transparent white paint. Now, I know what they mean. What they really mean is translucent, but they did not have an English major coming up with the names. Theoretically, if you have a tube of transparent white paint, tell me, quiz time, what should be in that tube? Yeah, either air or water. That's all. Not even water. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so there you go. White and opaque are synonymous. White and transparent are opposites. Anyway, so I don't want to add liquid to my white paint that makes it more transparent. I want this stuff right here to be opaque, 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 opaque. And of course, I want impasto because our eyes enjoy, get a kick out of impasto. So that's just a quick detail. So even though it's not cured, it's certainly... It's slightly rubbery, but I, I can touch it that way without any deleterious effects. Okay, so what I do on day two, the first thing that I do is glaze the entire painting again. Okay, so we glazed it two days ago during during the during my class, of course, we we glazed it. Now I'm gonna glaze it again. Any color, any colors that I want. Now this is way darker than I want. As I like to say often, witness my distress. <laughs> Are you with me? I want you to know, doesn't bother me that it's darker than it ought to be. Why? Because I have rags. <laughs> this wonderful invention called rags. <laughs> and if I make it a little bit dark, then that actually gives me the freedom to, to have a, a good effect. Besides that, I'm I'm, uh, I'm going to spread it out with my brush a little bit. So at the moment, I'm doing, at the moment, I happen to be doing this entire canvas, the entire painting with, again, liquid. In case you don't know what I'm saying, that's liquid original, the gel kind. So you don't need to, again, I'll point, point you at my palette. That's this stuff right here. It stays on your palette, so you don't need a cup. And I really like that because I don't like having liquid stuff and sloshing around. I don't like having a cup attached to my uh, palette. Okay, so I've just covered the entire painting and some parts of it look considerably better. Some parts of the painting look considerably better than it did it just a few minutes ago, but I am not finished. I am not gonna stop there. I'm gonna do some other glazes. And uh, this is very typical for me. I don't want to be stuck in a rut, but pretty typical for me to um, do a, a, a warm glaze and then follow up with a cool. Now, I just did something a moment ago, so I, I want to, here's a teaching moment. Um, I just stuck my, this brush into this pile of blue paint right here because I thought it was, um, I thought it was ultramarine. Turns out it's not, it's phthalo blue. And again, I'm saying this partly for you phthalo haters. <laughs> you people who hate phthalo blue, you just really need to get over it. So, but the problem is I've got now way too much, way too intense phthalo on this brush. Here's the way to fix this. I mentioned just this just the other day. 
Now I'm going to demonstrate for you. Over here is dioxazine violet. So I'm going to dip my brush moderately, generously, fairly generously in dioxazine, then come back over here to this thalo. And what I want to show you is dioxazine violet is sort of like a, what's the word, a remediation. It's like an antidote. No, antidote. Yeah, it's like an antidote to thalo blue. So again, those of you who are scared to death of thalo because it's a staining, it's a dye, it's a staining color. Um, just have some dioxazine there and look at it really quickly so it neutralizes uh, your thalo and turns it into almost an ultramarine blue. Well, no, it turns it into ultramarine blue. I've still got too much paint on this brush, so I'm going to go ahead and wipe it off. Okay. So there, that was a quick little detour. So now I've got cool on my brush and there are several places in this painting that I think I want some coolness happening how much coolness i don't know we mixing on mixing on the can painting on the canvas Ooh, here's a good opportunity man i i can't believe i didn't do that the other day do what <laughs> okay <laughs> let me I'll, I'll explain that in a minute let me con continue painting just for a minute i know you're getting a bad glare up here so I, i've got blue and of course, what's already on the uh, on the canvas that you saw me do just a few minutes ago is oxide red, orangish brown. Oxide red is very close to burnt sienna. You can use burnt sienna if you don't have an oxide red. It's a very close, very close second, good, good uh, substitute for the uh, oxide red. Okay, what else? I'm just down here a little bit. Okay, let me go back up to what I just had a ooh, ooh moment about up here. Uh, as soon as I finish, just a few more bits of this blue. And I am going to use a rag here in a few minutes to lift out areas. Okay, I just made this angle right here. A few minutes ago, this block was all the light color, and then I did this. Why is that an ooh? Let me try to let me try to explain that. The most this is not a Dan Nelsonism. I try to be clear when I'm saying something that's you know a weird Dan Nelsonism. This is not. The most important aspect of a painting is play of light. Play of light. That's in my opinion the best language for it. Um, play of light does not equal quote which way is the light coming from? And you can be a little bit mean for your own good for just a minute, for you students. You do not get any points for answering, for painting this question right, which way is the light coming from? You know, the classic apple, light. You get no credit for getting that right. Here's what you do get. You get ejected from the game if you get it wrong. In other words, you don't get any, I'm using an analogy here of a sporting event. You don't get any points on the board for getting this correct, which way is the light coming from. However, if you get it wrong, you are bounced off the field. You don't even get to play the game. Are you with me? So you can get vetoed by changing my word picture now. You can get a veto by getting it wrong, but you don't get any. The reason I'm saying this is, is this. I know a lot of students that in the early stages of their painting, they, they, um, struggle with, now which way is the light coming from? And when they get it right, that's, it's okay to struggle. Every, we all struggle. When they get it right though, here's what they do. Oh, I got it right. I got the light coming. This is the mistake right here, is patting yourself on the back and giving yourself credit. The reason is, as soon as you pat yourself on the back and give yourself credit, you relax and say, oh, I have arrived. I have done it. I have achieved something. And what I'm trying to do here is raise the bar on you so you don't get any points for that. Why? Because Getting which way is the light coming from does not equal play of light. Okay, play of light, and then I, boy, in my book I, I, that I'm working on, Breakable Laws of Painting, I use words like light exploding, springing, glistering, blistering, um, shining, no, nah, not strong enough, reflecting, second, secondary, tertiary, quarterary <laughs> reflections, secondary reflections, tertiary reflections, I'm sorry about that word. <laughs> um, uh, that's what you get credit for, okay? Play of light, and it's all kinds of stuff. Now, when I added 
and again, I'm surprised I didn't do this the other day when I was doing this painting. Just a minute ago, when I added this little angle right there, even though it's, this is very mild, and that in itself does not equate to play of light, it adds, uh, adds a little bit to the play of light that's occurring in the whole painting. Does that make sense? So again, I'm a, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I didn't do that the other day. It's like, because that's such an obvious gimme. Because it, it gives, again, just gives the viewer a feeling of, of what the light is doing. Gives me a little bit more. Um, while I was at it, I also, I don't know if you notice, I did half of this flag. I put this bluish color uh, on half the flag. So I, so that's, a little, again, half the flag is going to be in shade, half in sun. And uh, that's a little bit more play of light. Now, talking since I just talked about play of light, let me show you. This painting so far is full of, look at this down here. This is play of light. Uh, play of light just glowing, exploding off this. And I'm going to make it explode a little bit more by wiping it up back with a rag. And look how it's the light is diffusing. That's a good word, diffusing uh, around the, the porch railing. See? Uh, a less mature painter would make that railing <laughs> razor sharp because that's the way it is in the photograph. That would be a mistake. We are not copiers of photographs. We are go way beyond photographs as painters. Okay, so just watch me now. <laughs> I'll try to back down on the histrionics just a little bit. And now do... Now, by the way, I keep... I, there's so many things I'm teaching accidentally. Look what just happened to the impasto, the thick fat stuff, when I did a glaze on top of it. Now, I'm not going to leave it that way, but I'm going to modify it and keep some of that. So when you do glaze on top of impasto, it actually re-accentuates the impasto effect. It actually makes the dimensionality of the, because the paint is now, is stuck in the cracks. Do you follow me? Now, if I don't like it stuck in the cracks, I can pick up a brush, dip it in my Gamsol Turpenoid, and clean this all up. But it's, why would I do that? This is beautiful. And it also gives this beautiful patina. It makes this painting look classic. Makes it look almost old, but old and a good. Makes it look like it must have taken hours and hours and hours to paint this painting. Because look at that. Well, of course, as you know, it did not take hours and hours and hours to do this painting. I probably have, so far, a grand total of two hours in this painting. Hard to say because I was it was a demo while I was teaching. So what I'm doing basically right now is just taking my rag and lifting out areas of the painting that I want to appear lighter. I'm being rather discriminating. I'm being pretty careful there there that flag is so much better with some shade in front of it now part of the beauty of this scene and again I do have a photograph up here, you see from that I took, so you can see the correlation between what I'm painting and that. Um, I'm still using that a little, but part of the charm of this photograph is actually the secondary light. Sunlight, bounce number one, bounce number two, bounce number three, and so forth. It's all those s secondary and tertiary bounces that, that qualify as plenty of light. Man, I feel really bad about the, the bad, bad glare that you guys are getting. Um, okay. What else? I'm not sure if I want to lighten that window or not. I guess a little bit. Yeah, that's enough. And I'm going to lighten this pillar just a little bit. And this one too. Be really discreet about what. Oh, these these uh, spindles, pickets, they should be they should be lighter. Okay, so if I hadn't taken time 
to talk and to gab to you guys. What I just did should have taken five minutes, six minutes at the most. And the painting is, went from a, I don't know what, if it was a nine point, if it was an 8.9, went from an 8.9, went from an 8.9 to a 9.3 just in five minutes by glazing. Okay, now let's get down to the, the real nitty gritty. <laughs> um, what you do on day two. After you glaze it, what do you do next? Well, the next thing you do is any dark details that the painting needs. And this, it doesn't need much, but there's just a little bit here and there that I want to add to what's going on. So back to my palette for just a minute. I'm going to, I'm, whenever you want to get dark in your painting, and this is, this is review, review, review. For those of you who, who follow me, uh, you know this, you know this mantra, so to speak, like the back of your hand. You get dark with transparency, light with opaque. And I've given that lecture so many times that I am not going to repeat it <laughs> here today. I'm just going to state the principle. If you want any part of your painting to get darker, you do it with transparent color. So that, that's what I've got right here. No white, a little bit of liquid. Okay. And what I want to do is give a little bit of definition to this bush down here. Not much, not much. A little bit of definition to this railing. It almost disappears. I want it to almost disappear, but I don't want it to almost disappear that much. <laughs> Did you catch that? And I think I'm going to put one of those classic, you know, curly Q ends, wrought iron turns on the end of that railing there. The essence of good painting is making interesting marks. So every mark that you put on the canvas has to be an interesting one. Interestingness is paramount over, that is to say, is more important than similitude, than realism than accuracy. It's more important that the mark be interesting than it is that it be accurate. Now, I'm all over accurate drawing. Whew! Don't mistake me for one of those impressionistic painters that does impressionism because they can't do realism. Oh my goodness. And I said to my class the other day, everybody, including any of you who are watching, if you're a painter, every artist should should do at least one knock them dead hyper realistic painting every artist should do at least one get it done get it out of your system you can trace you can project you can grid you know to get the drawing accurate and everybody should should get out their tiny brushes stick out their tongue and do a ton of what i call tongue painting um uh, first of all, because, and I'm I'm here I'm speaking mostly to, you know, the kind of people that take my classes who are, you know, used, they're intermediate painters and they're getting better, uh, but they paint more or less the way most people paint these days, which is impressionistic. Are you with me? Most students and wannabe painters and emerging painters and so forth are painting roughly like this, not realism, but impressionism. Now, those who are, um, so I'm not addressing those of you who are, are doing already hyper-realistic painting. I'm, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who are, who are doing impressionistic painting. What I say to you is you should take a pause, hit the pause button on your regular painting, and you should take the time, weeks if, it ta if necessary, to do at least one super-duper-duper-duper photorealistic painting. Because okay? you're going to learn a lot about paint, about impressionistic painting in the course of your doing one realistic painting. Are you with me? Plus, then you, could, then you can convince yourself that you're doing impressionistic painting not because you're unable to do realism, but because you choose to do it. That goes a long way to build your confidence. Okay? Plus, if you want, you can point, it, point out to your friends, see, I did a super realistic painting one time. Some of you might decide that you like it so much you'll quit the impressionistic stuff. And that's all right if that's 
if that's what, you know, your assignment in life is supposed to be. I'll be with you in just a second, Doug. Thanks for coming in. Um, I'm going to take a quick break here. Uh, just want to give, as I said, a little bit of definition to this foliage that's down here. Not much. And a little bit up here, I believe. Yeah. Anywhere else? Yeah, I think I'm a little bit up here. Again, just the impression of leaves, just a few leaves, not to get carried away. Uh, a shadow here. Am I still in the screen? Yep, okay, but I'm, you're getting a lot of glare. Sorry about that. Um, let's do some of these ribs in the in the tin roof. Let's re-accentuate those just a little bit. And then a shadow underneath. There we go. There we go. Oh, and I sort of lost my shadow, so I'm going to read with a... There. There we go. That's better. Okay. Hang on. I'll be back in just a few minutes to continue this finishing a painting that I started in class just a couple days ago. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed the name. Somebody just left a comment, said it was a nice painting. Thank you very much. I think it is a, uh, the painting has potential and um, I have the ability to blow it. <laughs> I have a, have a really good skill at taking a painting that's, that's going pretty well and overdo it. In fact, I, I shared with my students uh, two days ago where I started this painting. Um, I was going through some kind of archive. It wasn't my website, but somewhere where I was looking at a number of my paintings from years past, and I had I had the the paintings uh, in stages. That is, I could see you know layer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. So I could see the paintings as they progressed. I was quite dismayed. Uh, as, as I went through these paintings, I was quite dismayed to, to discover that there were a number of those paintings that I should have quit <laughs> at an earlier stage. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> you know, sometimes the best lessons in life, usually the best lessons in life, hurt a little bit. Are you, are you with me? I don't think there's ever been anything that that, that really convinced me of this more than that that experience uh, looking at paintings from maybe th two three four years ago and and realizing that in several cases a handful of cases I should have quit <laughs> earlier because the painting got worse not better as I continued ouch <laughs> that hurts that really hurts okay but it's a great lesson to learn right Great lesson to learn. Okay, here's a little trick worth doing. If I can bring a little bit of a branch down in front of this, in front of this, uh, I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> I'm gonna re reserve the right to take that off. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think I will like it when I finish. So right now I'm using dark. And uh, let me go ahead and say, Again, this is not a Dan Nelsonism. This is a pretty much a universal art professorism. And it is this. Darks first. Lights last. And I have to look at some an architectural detail here. There is a very confusing thing happening here. Very strange. I don't know what to make of it, but I, uh, in the in, in in actuality, the the railing to the porch is coming off this pillar, but that doesn't make any sense because the entrance to the porch should be here. So even though 
in actuality, uh, there's a there's a, a step onto the porch at this point. Um, nobody who would look at my painting would believe me. They would say that's that's a mistake. The railing's supposed to be up this. I, I trust you understand what I'm saying. Uh, so I didn't catch that the other day. I just I just looked at it more carefully right now. I went wait a minute. That's crazy. So there's some very unusual architectural thing happening. Okay, back to what I was saying about this is not a Dan Nelsonism. It is darks first, lights last. So anytime you add, anytime you put dark paint on your canvas, your painting is not finished. It's not finished till you follow up with light paint. In other words, the dark, dark paint is always the wind up light paint is always the follow through or the pitch if we use a baseball analogy the the applying dark paint is a setup the coming back and finishing with light paint is the follow through the finish of the setup okay so uh and that's any any time any time any time um Okay, I think I might be good enough. Okay. Okay, just a quick, just a quick, another word since I'm here, that uh, if you're painting in this style, in my technique, and if you want to take a break and finish tomorrow, this is a perfect, perfect spot to take a break because it is actually easier to do the next stage if everything you just put on is dry. Um, by the way, I used a lot of liquid. Everything I just put on will be dry uh, in an hour and a half. So you really don't need to take, you don't have to sleep on it. You can just take a, a long lunch break and come back and all that will be dry. And then you can, it's easier to apply the next layer. Just easier, that's all. Not necessarily better, just easier. So now I'm, I'm back to the final layer the final phase of my painting process, which is light, opaque, highlights, sparkle. Um, I'm gonna do some on the flag, some on this roof, some on the house, some on the porch, and some on this bush, etc., etc. Are you with me? Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the lightest, lightest object in the painting, which is the, uh, this porch railing right here that's catching all that sun. So it's almost done. It's almost good enough just as it is. Almost. But I'm going to come back with it with, I've, I've now got white, titanium white on my brush brushes with a tiny bit of yellow ochre. So it's just a, a warm white. So all I'm doing is pushing the values just one more time. Just, you, you, in my opinion, in my opinion, you can hardly, you can hardly overdo uh, the values on a painting. Now, not everybody agrees with that. There's some moderately famous guy who has actually has pieces in the North Carolina Art Museum, which is astounding to me. That must have been under previous leadership when they were giving benefit to local living artists, because I don't think he's that good. <laughs> Be that you didn't hear that from me, but um, he he. he keeps all of his paintings between a uh, about a three and a seven value. So it's all, it's a landscapes, but it's all very muted. Very strange to me, very strange that, that he considers that good. But I just say that because there's some good painters. He's a good painter. I don't think he's a great painter, but there's some good painters who don't believe that, uh, you know, I like my paint. I like paintings to go all the way from zero to ten, black, 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 black to white, 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 white. 
and everything in between. But not everybody feels the same way. So that's, I'm just acknowledging that that is certainly a matter of opinion. Um, so all I've done so far is just, again, push the, the light on this. It was already the lightest part of my painting, but I'm making it even lighter once again, even lighter. I really like exploding light. Sunlight exploding off things because I, I think that's I think that's the way we we feel the real world around us. That's the way we experience sunlight. I'm just gonna come up here and fuzz those soften this edges a little bit. Okay, having done that now, same thing up here. Let's come up here and do that same exploding, glistering, blistering, brilliant, fun, dance, light party. Just go. I think our eyes love to see in a pain we love to see that kind of that kind of effect i'm going to continue now with the uh up on that green tin roof i talked to my students the other day as we were doing this and i explained to them that we don't have just because the the tin roof is green in the photograph of course does not mean that we have to make it green in our painting but we do ask ourselves, as we look at the photograph, we scratch our chin and say, hmm, is, is that green, is the greenness, if I can use it as an adjective, is the greenness of that roof part of what attracts me to this scene? Is it part of what makes, made me feel like this was a good picture for painting? And in this case, I concluded that it was. I'm just saying that because it, painting it green almost puts us in danger of why am I doing it green? Because it's green in the photograph. That's always a bad answer. That is not the answer. I'm doing it green because it looks cool. Now, would I have thought of doing it green if it wasn't that way in the photograph? No, probably not. Although, although I would like to think that I would have considered it. What if it had been gray? What if it had been rust red? Well... I, I, I might have done it red, but I hope I would have still given it consideration and asked myself the question, am I doing it red because it's simply because it's red in the photograph? And I would hope the, my answer would have been no, <laughs> I'm doing it red because it looks good red. And I, I think that's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing it green because it looks good green. I don't have to do it green. Now, if I was doing this painting for the owner of this house, that would be a different story, wouldn't it? Then, yes, of course, he knows his, his or her roof is red and uh, may expect it to be so in, in the portrait of his house. But I'm not doing it for the owner of this house, so it doesn't, does not matter. Okay, and I think that's, I think that's good enough. You see how, I think you can see how I'm allowing much of the underpainting. This is all mostly acrylic underpainting. Of course, it's got a couple glazes of oil on top of it, but that's all underpainting and I'm allowing a lot of that to show through. Again, uh, this is critical to my approach to painting is that you allow as much of the underpainting to show through as possible. Okay, while I've got this pale green on my brushes, I'm going to go ahead and do some of this roof up here. And again, forgive me, I know you're getting a terrible glare. I wonder if I can move you like this and uh, maybe let you see a little bit better what's going on. I'm trying to mix up a color green that's not too shocking, 
Not, it, it's closer to the color that's there. Okay, I think that'll do. Again, allowing as much of the underpainting to show through. Now, you understand, as soon as you put another layer of paint on top of the finished painting, then everything in the previous layers, all those layers become underpainting. Are you with me? <laughs> What's the definition of underpainting? The answer is anything that's got paint on top of it. <laughs> it's, in my definition, then, it's the underpainting. And I think I'm going to do just a tiny bit of... Uh, edge right there, palette knife painting, yeah, that'll do, I'll add it back over here just for a bit, okay, okay, What what's next now, um, I'm going to hit the flag, Of course, if you were, have been with me the last half hour or so, you saw that I did a, a dirty, dirty glaze across the flag right here, which I think is going to make the, the flag much more interesting. So the whole flag is no longer in sunlight. Uh, part of it is in shade. So that I, again... Every time you add dark to the painting, to the canvas, it's the wind-up. So I did dark on the, on the flag. That means I must come back now and do light. In this case, re-accentuating, re-lighting where the sun is hitting the flag. And if you, you can go back to two days ago and watch me do this flag, and, and I talk about how... This is American flag. Since the stripes are going this way, you paint this way, not this way. In other words, I did that part of the red. I'll do this part, and uh, not that part. I'll do red right there, right there, and right there. That gives it the the feeling of fabric of blowing in the breeze. All those little ripples. You see that? I'm sure you do. And uh, same thing up here, a little bit of this, see, the, um, by adding this little bit of red, I'm re-accentuating the, the sun, the play of light on this flag. Okay, done with the red. I'm going to wipe off these brushes. Oh, I can, let me zoom in here better. I'm sorry, I was didn't realize I was so far out. Okay, I have, actually, if you probably, I think if you, if you, want to see me paint an American flag, besides I did it last Sunday, but I've done a, a more extensive clinic, if you will, on painting the American flag. Um, I think if you just back out to YouTube and do a search for Dan Nelson American flag or paint how to paint American flag, I think you can find uh, my little little demo on it. And of course, that's, that's no big help to those to my friends in other parts of the world <laughs> but in america you know a scene like this uh, a cityscape a city scene often has an american flag in it somewhere okay now i've got light uh warm white on my brushes See, I don't, in other words, I'm not painting, I don't hold my brush and paint a white stripe. No, that would be horrible. Instead, I'm actually doing more dashes, dot and dash, painting across the flag this way. So that I end up with this ripply effect. And the ripples uh, go across the stripes. Does that make sense? 
it's real easy to do wherever there's a bit of bright red, like right now, where there's a, a, a row of bright red, which I did just a few minutes ago, I'm going to put bright white in the same row. See? Ah, oh. <laughs> a little while ago, this flag was languishing a little bit for energy. It just wasn't popping. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the sound of an artist happy with his work. My goodness, what an improvement that made on, on this, uh, on the whole painting. That when I started this, this today, when I left the other day, the, the flag was all one color, putting that shadow across the middle of it. Forgive me, that was brilliant. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, look at me tongue painting now. I'm holding the brush. Very rare moment. Take a picture of it. Okay, just want to re-emphasize those stars. And I talked about this the other day. Here's the here's the the counterintuitive reality for an American flag. You paint the stars first, and not too many of them, as you can see. No other, I'm not going to put 50 stars on that flag. <laughs> that would be nuts. Totally out of keeping with the the nature of the painting, right? It would be way overdone. So no, just a few stars to represent the 50, because again, the fabric is, is wafting in the breeze. So some stars are in shade, and there's a, some are bright and some are not bright. Um, you get that by painting in layers, layers and layers and layers. I'm mixing up now. I'm trying to mix up a medium, medium blue. Okay. I, I, the counterintuitive thing is you paint the stars first. Then you come back and paint the blue field around, between the stars. You paint the stars first and the blue second. Now, why is that? So glad you asked. Um, it's a universal principle. I'll try to state it this way. So it's not, this is not just limited to American flags. We, we do the same thing when we, and you probably, if you paint any landscapes at all, you do sky holes. You do a painting of a tree and then you come back and paint the light, light sky between the tree. Okay. Now, some of you, that's the only time in your life that you exercise this particular Principle, but let me tell you what the principle is. The principle is our eyes enjoy being fooled. I'm mixing up a, a lighter blue right now, by the way. Our eyes enjoy being fooled by what's on top of what. Again, so that's counterintuitive. A non-artist would stamp his foot and say, No, I don't enjoy, I don't, don't enjoy being fooled ever. Well, that's a non-artist talking who is ignorant. The fact is, the better the artist is, the better they are at manipulating you, the better they are at fooling you, if you will. So let's go back to the, the more, well, let's talk about this, the, 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 the flag, since I'm painting it. Everybody knows that the white star is on the blue field, right? Intellectually, we know that is the case. I mean, even if it's a cheap flag and it's just painted, printed, you know, it's not sewn on. If it's an expensive flag, then the white stars are an additional piece of fabric on top of the blue, right? But even if it's a cheap flag, our mind says, our mind says um, that the, uh, the flag, the star is on top of the blue. Now, by, by the way, hang on here a second. After saying all that, I'm going to, I'm going to do one, at least one star now that's actually on top of the blue. What? Aren't you contradicting yourself? Nope, nope. I'm actually just taking it to one more level of sophistication. The principle is still the same. Our eye enjoys being fooled by what's on top of what. So if I, if I make some of these stars underpainted and some of the stars overpainted, our brain has a little hiccup of confusion, a little flutter of what's on top of what, the visual part of our brain. And that little flutter of confusion is actually an, a a little bit of ecstasy. It's a little bit of aesthetic pleasure. 
We get the same thing when you paint the tree than the sky. Everybody knows the sky is further away than the tree in reality, right? But when the sky paint is closer to the viewer than the tree paint, the, our brain, if it's done well, our brain gets a little wiggle of confusion. What? 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 What's on top of what? And I'm, I'm sounding like right now like it's irritating, but it's actually a little tiny bit of ecstasy, believe it or not. I can use that extreme word advisedly. That is aesthetic pleasure. So that's why you paint the the uh, blue the the white flag the white stars first and the blue field second. Again, I'm I gotta tell you I'm I am pretty darn happy with that. Uh, hang on, let me get it here. Uh, with that flag, some of you are wondering why can't I just aim it? The answer is because there's about a four second delay. Okay. So that's, that's why it takes me so long because I'm looking at my monitor and it takes several seconds for the monitor to catch up to, to, what, to what the camera's doing. That's why, that's why you can't figure out, why is he so bad at aiming that thing? That's why. <laughs> I just thought I'd better explain that. Okay. Um, thinking, thinking. Oh, I'm so much happier with that flag now than than the way it was a few minutes ago. So what I'm trying to convey here is that the sun's hitting the top of the flag here over the roof and and this pillar is casting. And I don't think it's technically correct. I don't think the shadow would be exactly there, but I think it's close enough that, that our eye interprets the rest. I don't want to get too comp Okay, too complicated. I think the next assignment now for me, and here's where, whew, let me stop for a moment. Let me take, take a deep breath and uh, talk to myself as I talk to you. <sighs> it's me taking a deep breath. Um, here's where I can blow it. This painting is very close to a really good painting, I think. But I can still blow it really easily, really easily. And the, the way to blow it would be to paint too much. I could stop right where it is, sign it, and say, I'm done. I really could. Um, but I think I can improve on it slightly. There, and that's the danger, is <laughs> feeling like you can improve on it. Let me point out a couple places where I think. Well, first of all, there's this, this dark shape right here doesn't make any sense at all. You see, there's like three layers of fascia. This is called fascia. One, two, three. Three levels of fascia. By the way, I think I'm going to clean that up just a minute. And there's three levels here. And here there's two. One, two, and then part of one, but it's either a big board has been knocked out of this house. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to, there's a little bit of repair job. I'm going to fix that. I think that these, this side of the porch and these railings right here should be getting a little bit more secondary light. And this, oh, right here, I have to fix this for sure. I remember I changed my mind a few minutes ago. I used to have a railing coming down here because that's actually the way it is in the photograph, but it doesn't make any sense. The railing should be coming down from here. So I've made that change. So yes, I need to correct some drawing right there. And I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, bright, uh, chartreuse yellow green on some of these palm fronds where the sun is just hitting let me show you the photograph just for a second and tell you that i'm not going to do what's in the photograph okay i'm not going to do all of this it's nice i like it in the photograph but i don't need it in my painting i just need a little especially like this down here I'm, i want a little bit of that some of this i don't know maybe i'm not sure about the green there uh oh and one other thing i want to do so I'm, I'm just giving a, a limited list saying, I'm telling myself, okay, Nelson, be careful. You know, when you achieve these things, quit. Don't just keep muddling along because um, that's what ruins paintings. I do believe that this wall of this house, so there's, here's one house, the one that, that's the star of the show. There's actually three houses, right? This railing belongs and this post right here and these stairs belong to the closest house. Then there's the show off house. And then there's a third house behind it. Here's some windows and gable and so on. And this wall right here and this wall right there, I think need to be smoothed out a little bit and brightened a little bit. Uh, it's a yellow house and I just think that would be better. 
Okay, so that there's sort of my grocery list. And again, I'm saying that to you guys partly so that I can hear myself say it. Uh, because it's easy to turn off your brain and just have so much fun painting that you just start tootling along. That's the word. You got it? Tootle, tootle, tootle. You just start tootling along, having a good time, and before you know it, dang it, you've overdone it. Make sense? I'm going to. My feet are getting sore. I like painting standing up better up until the point that your feet get sore. <laughs> then... I don't like painting standing up. I like painting sitting down better. <laughs> I give you all permission to do the same. You young people don't know what we're talking about. Trust me. You will someday. So let me lower my camera down a little bit. Okay. Now, let me tackle let me tackle the most difficult, which is this redrawing this railing <laughs> right here. <laughs> I put my palette behind me so I could lower the canvas and then forgot to put it back. There we go. By the way, I, in case some of you are just new to me following me, I am in my upstairs studio. I am a ridiculously blessed artist. I have a beautiful studio downstairs on the main floor of our house. And, oh, what do you know? I also have a fully complimented studio upstairs. <laughs> it's a long story. How does that happen? It happens from being an artist for many, 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 many years and from having a wife who affirms my career as an artist. <laughs> and uh, so the bonus room over the garage, that's where I am right now, is my one studio. And my other studio is what is essentially the living room in our house. Anyway, so I'm upstairs and uh, this used to be my illustration studio. I have an airbrush up here. Uh, I have my light table up here and so on and so forth. It used to be illustration, but when my grandchildren moved in temporarily a year ago, <laughs> I found I needed a place where I could escape their happy noises so that I could talk to you guys without, without so much background noise. So that's where I am today. They are downstairs making many happy noises. And I love it. Love having them here, but love the fact that I'm able to escape so I can meet with you all. Um, once again, the most important aspect of painting is making the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. I shared with my students the other day. Let me just pick one name, one that I pick very often. What's the difference between me and Richard Schmid? And I, through gritted teeth, <laughs> I say, I confess that Richard Schmid is a better painter than I. I also confess that I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so where there's life, there's hope. Uh, what is the difference? Is he a better drawer than I am? Yeah, maybe. I'm not quite willing to totally yield on that point, maybe. Um, is he better composition? Yeah, I think he might really might have some compositional edges on me. I'm, I'm not being neither arrogant nor humble here. I'm just trying to be realistic. Because I think I know what the number one difference between me and Richard Schmidt is. It would be fun if he ever heard me, heard me saying these things. I'd be love to hear his input. The difference between me and Richard Schmidt is his marks are better than my marks. His marks better than my marks. His marks better than mine. His marks are better because he knows what he's doing better than I do. His marks are better than mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, same thing. For, uh, same thing for um, Jeremy Mann. I say this through. You know what I mean. I'm being kind of. I'm being quite facetious when I say true gritted teeth. Um, Jeremy Mann. Is he better than I am? Rucka, shucka, rucka. Yes, he is. Is he better drawer? Yeah, probably. But I'm still working on it. Um, what's better about him? His marks, clearly. So I am doing all I can to learn what these men know that I don't know yet. I don't think it was until within the last 10 years. I'm quite positive. I didn't know until the last 10 years that that was the primary 
distinction. If I'm better than you, what is it that's probably most better than you? Am I a better drawer? Yeah, possibly. But you can, you can. I mean, even if you tr project and trace and grid and do all kinds of things, um, like if I did all those things, I still wouldn't be as good as Richard Schmid. So that, that I'm, I'm not giving, I'm not giving, I'm not, not saying that the issue is they're a better drawer. I could cheat more if I really needed to. But no, it's that's not it. It's the it's the marks. And if I'm better than you, it's probably because my marks are better than yours. And I'm saying that to encourage you to at least be pelting down the right artistic path. Would you please be working down toward the right goal? Okay, this is almost almost too fastidious. That's why I'm scratching. I'm just messing it up a little bit. Uh, another and I uh, these are these are my three names that I name the most. There are many more fabulous, unbelievable painters in the world. Don't get me wrong. There's many, 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 many that are better than I. But there are, I've picked three that I feel like, in a sense, I'm chasing. I've already mentioned two: Richard Schmidt, Jeremy Mann. The third is Tibor Nagy. T i b is in boy. Tibor. T i b o r. Tibor Nagy, Eastern European. Uh, I forget, sorry, Lithuania, Latvia, I forget. Uh, likewise, and in, and in Tibor's case, it is so obvious to me, why is he better than I am? And again, I, in jest, sort of, I say, I say that through gritted teeth um, because I have such a strong thirst to be better myself, not to be better than them. You know, no, no, I'm just using them as goads, prods to my own, my own artistic progress. Um, Tibor Nagy in particular. Why is he better? Because his marks are ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Tibor, I hope you hear this sometime. Somebody said, please tell Tibor. There's this crazy guy over there in North Carolina that keeps... thinks you're a god. <laughs> he would probably be tickled to hear that. I've communicated with him just a little bit. Uh, over the years. Communicated with Richard Schmid just enough to get permission from him uh, and his daughter, actually, who's kind of his agent. To I had permission to use Richard Schmid's uh, paintings in my book, uh, The Breakable Laws of Painting. Some of you are wondering, where, where, how's that book coming? The answer is not very well. <laughs> just, uh, just because I haven't had time to work on it much this past year. Um, I try to do each day when I get out of bed, try to do what is appropriate. I'll use non-religious language. Initially, I'll say I try to do what the cosmos has for me to do. And I, I'm pretty comfortable using that language, actually. I'm also pretty comfortable out saying I'm get up every day and try to do what God has for me to do. I don't want to say that and get some of you people all turned into pretzels about religious issues. Um, this is not the appropriate place. Well, I don't want to alienate people too bad. So if you, that alienates you, let's go back to I get up every day and do what the cosmos has for me to do, what is on my path to do. <laughs> okay, are we doing well? I think I think so. Um, and so there was a whole bunch of redrawing. It's a little bit too neat. There. Yep, that's better. Believe it or not, that's better. Isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that that would actually work? Just, just make a mess, scratchy mess, and in a sense, it, it makes it feel better. One time, and I've only done this one time, I was teaching a, a painting class down in um, Orlando, Florida, a couple years ago, and uh, been there twice, and um, class of about twenty. There was a lady right in front of me to my left, and 
this was a three-day class. So we had really had time to get into it. And uh, she'd been working on her painting very fastidiously for a number of minutes, maybe an hour. And I forget her name. Maybe it was Brenda. And I said, Brenda, would you give me permission to touch your painting? And she smiled and said, sure. Usually, you know, I, always, I try to always ask. And usually students are glad to say yes because they think I'm going to make their painting better, which I hope to do. Uh, so she said, yeah. So I don't know if you can picture this or not. I picked up her painting, and I was standing in front of the class, so I held the painting um, facing the class, facing her and the rest of the class. In other words, the back of the canvas was toward me. And I said, okay. And I took a, a brush about, this is a fun story. I took a brush about this big. It was dry, like this. I held the I held the canvas up in front of me <laughs> like this, facing the class. I took this brush and I went. <laughs> it was an oil painting, so it was all wet. Of course, she screamed and fainted dead away. The rest of the she didn't really faint dead away. I'm kidding. She just about did though. The rest of the class, all, some of them also screamed. And when I got everybody to stop screaming. I calmly asked, now I've only done this one time. It, it was a moment. It was, I, I, it was, I couldn't, you know, I just knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that this was the right thing to do. It wasn't as cocky as it sounds. If it was cocky, I would do it in every class. That would be cocky. Right? It was, it was a moment. I knew that it was going to work. Anyway, when the, once the screaming and fainting was over, I said, call me to the class. Is her painting better? And through stupefied, dropped jaws and wide open eyes, the whole class proceeded to nod. Yeah, her painting's better. <laughs> okay, so what I just did to my own self right there with the, with, the, with the handle of one of these brushes is essentially what I did to her painting. I, I, I'm, still, I'm still positively surprised that that works. And, and when I look at it, now I can see many places. Look at it. I mean, there's a, I, uh, there's a line that goes through there, that goes up there, it goes on there. I did it all really fast, so it wasn't planned. You know, I just went like that. Um, it amazes me the degree to which th that it's true, that I made the painting better a few minutes ago when I did that. That is, again, counterintuitive. It's like, that is nuts. What do you mean that makes it better? And uh, I was greatly encouraged in this regard two years ago when I, last time I got, and I can't wait to go back, the last time I got into Oil Painters of America two years ago in Dallas. And uh, as I walked, there were 200 paintings in the show. Um, as I walked around the room of all these really good painters, I mean, everybody in that show was a good painter. Um... I, it was an eye-opening experience because I discovered that if there was a spectrum, neat, messy, I was on the neater end of the spectrum with this kind of stuff. Isn't that crazy? Most of the artists, not all, there were some hyper-realists there, which is just fine, but most of the artists at Oil Painters of America, it's safe to say, it is very safe to say, most of the artists, artists who are in Oil Painters of America the good ones, the masters, are messier than I am. And I'm pretty messy. Don't you agree? So that's all. doesn't mean that messy is good. Uh, it, 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 what it means is our eye enjoys interpreting shapes even more than, I'll put it this way, even more than you think it does. And I know I'm being judge, I'm judging your... I don't really mean you, of course, I mean me. Our eye enjoys, that is a huge part of the aesthetic pleasure of a painting, is the painter, in real hyper-realism, the painter does all the work and tells you what everything is. In what I call good painting, and I know that's a judgmental statement, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now. When I, when, when, I, in good painting, the, the, 
artist does not do all the work. The viewer finishes all the details in their brain. And that act of finishing the details, I contend, is one of the chief ingredients of aesthetic pleasure when it comes to when it comes to two-dimensional art painting. It is the finishing of the picture in the viewer's mind that brings aesthetic pleasure. I like to say joy juice is released in the brain of the viewer when the brain when the brain the mind of the viewer has to finish the picture. Okay, so that's what, when we do impressionistic painting, that's what we're playing with, this very, very, very delicate balance between um, explaining things and not explaining things, allowing the, the viewer, I'm looking for my palette knife now, here it is. Um, I contend that hyperrealism does give us a degree of aesthetic pleasure. And here I'm getting in trouble again. I had one of my watchers in the last couple of days has been very critical of me. <laughs> Some of you might have read his comments. I will not name him or her. Um, um, been very critical because he, he, I think it's a he, thought I was criticizing other artists who do realism. Nothing could be further from the truth. Like my guess is I do much, I don't know, but my guess is I do much more and much better hyperrealism than this person does who's criticizing me. Um, if you want to see my hyperrealism, it's real easy. Go to my website, dannelsonart.com. Go to three places, illustrations, automotive art, and portraiture. And you can see some of my realism. I still, I, I enjoy doing realism. It's, for me, it's like taking a vacation. It's fun. It's re very relaxing to do realism. Um, but I think Oh, so I was going to say, we do receive an aesthetic pleasure because human beings, all except for the ones who have been corrupted by the art establishment, those who have, so to speak, drunk the Kool-Aid, um, and they are grumpy every time they see beauty. Um, except for those, we all, all of us, derive a very significant amount of pleasure by looking at something, a picture, very realistically drawn or painted by a human being. That's all, that's all that needs to be. Just drawn or painted accurately by a human being gives us a kind of aesthetic pleasure. You with me? You with me so far? There's kind of a but coming, but there's not, it's not really a but. That's a period. Period. We get a kick out of seeing think something beautifully rendered. Forgive me here. I'm having to take a minute to mix up a... Uh, chartreuse of bright yellow green for this bush here okay so you with me so far we all get a kick again all except for our professors uh, who have drunk the kool-aid they don't get pleasure out of it at all it, they, they would rather poke themselves in the eye than see something beautifully rendered by a human being but the rest of us who are not corrupted by the establishment we get a kick i'm pretty serious about that and i don't mind being nasty about that because that is the truth the emperor is naked, and one of these days, the entire Western world will recognize that the emperor is naked. And then all those million-dollar paintings uh, will be relics of history, and they'll be worth something because we will marvel that people used to pay huge amounts of money for that stuff. Anyway, um, so all human beings get a kick out of seeing some. Uh, seeing something beautifully accurate, accurately rendered. I don't mean beautifully, accurately rendered, okay? But I don't think that's the highest form of aesthetic pleasure. I think higher than that is what I'm trying to do here today when I'm not doing super realism is uh, your brain has to finish the picture. And I think that gives you a higher degree of aesthetic pleasure okay end of end of that lecture i'm gonna let that rest right there i've given it many times before and i'm not going to go any further with it right now as you can see though i'm trying to uh, get a little bit of green highlights into these bushes 
Now, part of the, I don't, I don't really need to do, uh, again, I don't need to do green because it's in the picture. Are you with me? No. I, I, I'm saying, no, I don't need to do green because it's in the picture. I'm doing green. The main reason is because it gives me, it finishes the color wheel in this painting. I have uh, yellow, orange, red, uh, not much purple. By the way, I'm probably going to fix that in a bit. A little bit right there, a little bit there and there and there. Okay, more purple than I thought. Yellow, orange, red, purple, and everything in between. Purple, blue, right? Blue, uh, uh, not much blue. I'm going to have more in a minute. And uh, 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 green. So my color wheel is complete. And generally speaking, again, this is a philosophical statement. Generally speaking, it's not an absolute rule, it's a general rule. Generally speaking, given the choice, our eyes, I like to say it this, I like to say it this way, our eyes would rather yes see than no see. Oh boy, somebody's talking to me. There's variation, really means in the face. You're exactly right. Of course, of course, there's a whole degree, and I mean, I call what I'm doing is is a is a realistic is a realistic painting, uh, but it's not. It's it's impressionistic realism, right? So, of course, there's a whole range. But most of us, you, most of us know what I'm talking about when I say realism, a real tight realism, or photo realism, or extreme realism. You know what I mean, and I have. Little examples of that. There's a pair of blue jeans in my in my airbrush section of my website that um, is pretty pretty realism. I mean the threads the threads in the jeans are rendered accurately. I know what blue jean threads look like <laughs> under magnifying glass. Um, okay, let me go back to the statement I was making a minute ago. Given the choice, given the option. Our eyes would rather yes see than no see. Let me say the same thing in different words. Given the choice, our eyes like variety. Given the choice, our eyes would rather see more than less. And that gets some less mature person to say, yeah, but less is more. Because they heard somebody else say it and it sounded smart when that other person said it. So they say it even though they don't know philosophically really what they mean by that. And I'm going to say, no, 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 that is an ironic statement. There's a degree of truth in it, but it is not a universal. More means more. That's why we call it more. And given the choice, our eyes would rather see more than less. Okay, I'm going to clean off these brushes, and I'm going to continue around the color wheel since I talked about blue. I've done green. By the way, I already had some green up here, didn't I? But now I've got more. And the next thing is blue, but almost the only blue in the painting right now is this flag. But I'm going to do a little bit of, believe it or not, a little bit of sky up here. And that, that deserves, and maybe some sky in these windows, I'm not sure. And that deserves some very special attention. Uh, so stick with me if you can. I'll be back in just a few minutes to do... Hello, Femox. I'm back. I hope you. I hope you're still with me. I had to take a little break. Uh, I got a number of things going on in the house today. One of which is my handyman Doug is over here repairing various things around the house, so I get interrupted occasionally. Okay, I am mixing up a medium midtone opaque blue because, in fact, I discussed this with my students the other day, and we determined. Let me show you the photograph again. We determined that this scene would look better if there was actually sky up here. Now, in actuality, there's a shingled roof that's pale blue-gray be peeking between the leaves of this tree. Uh, this wall, this again, this is Charleston, South Carolina. Beautiful, beautiful old houses. This looks like a church or some kind of government building is big flat surface um, by the way you notice I moved the flag from back there to up here and I added some windows that are not here in the wall at all and I'm also taking liberty of <clears throat> chopping down this 
this building for sky. The, the reason for that, again, we discussed this as a class, is that uh, if I leave this the way it is, there's no, the, the, the furthest object is this wall and it's, it's quite a solid block. But if I punch through or over and give some sky, it gives the painting a deeper dimension, a deeper sense of dimension. There's some stuff up here that's farther away. Now, by doing this, adding sky to a place where there essentially was no sky, I'm sort of breaking one of the rules of my approach to painting. Sort of, but I'm going to explain in a minute why I'm not breaking. But here's here's the rule, and this, this is a hard one for my students because it's so unusual. It's hard for my students to, to get a hold of, so I want to be sure I state this rule very clearly and very cleanly, even though it looks like I'm violating it right now. The rule is when you finally get to the the overpainting, <laughs> which is a term we don't use normally, or what I prefer to call the final edit stage of the painting, which is almost always light, opaque highlights. When you finally get to the final edit, you don't add anything, no objects. You don't add objects to the scene. You don't add objects to the painting. Does that make sense? Uh, for instance, like you'll notice there's no foliage, green leaves on these branches up here. It would be a disaster to add green leaves to those branches. I mean, maybe one or two, that's okay. But you don't come up here and start painting like a traditional oil. You see, a traditional oil painter is painting in layers, I, if, if even using that term generously, layers of opaque color. That's how a traditional, in traditional, in the traditional oil painting world, all the colors are opaque. So in that world, you can add a tree or a bush or a cow in the middle of the field that was not there early on. Are you with me? My approach to painting, because it is very transparent, obviously, I mean, it's the most, that is the most salient dis brief description of Dan Nelson painting style is transparent. That's what it's all about. I, therefore, if it's transparent, it's like a watercolor painting. And I, yeah, those of you who don't do watercolors, then you're lost. You don't know what I mean by that. Those of you who do watercolors, you know exactly what I mean by that. In watercolor painting, if there's a blade of grass in front of the horse that's standing in the pasture in front of the mountain, are you with me? Objects one in front of the other. In watercolor painting, the blade of grass gets painted the same time, the same layer as the mountain in the background. In traditional oil painting, you can paint the sky first, then the mountain, then the hill, then the tree, then the barn, then the horse, then the fence, then the blade of grass in front of the fence, because everything's opaque. You can pile it up this way. That's, in my opinion, boring oil painting. Um, but when you paint in transparent layers, you can't do that. If there's going to be a blade of grass in front of the fence, you have to make allowances for that from the get-go. Okay, so again, I hope, I hope I haven't lost you. This, is, this only pertains to those of you who are trying to emulate my technique. Both of you. <laughs> um, you do not add things. Uh, this, uh, this is such a radical departure for some of you from traditional oil painting that you're having a hard time grasping what I'm saying. Um, you don't add the flag last. The flag is worked in early, early, early in the process. You don't add this railing down here. You don't add that last. It's part of the initial uh, presence of the painting. Okay, now it looks as though I'm violating that rule right now because I'm adding sky that wasn't there. Well, a couple exceptions. One is, of course, in my mind, the sky was there all along. It just happened to be underpainted in orange, so you couldn't see it. The other thing that makes it a slight exception is that the sky, instead of being the closest thing, is actually the furthermost thing. So again, I'm doing that same, playing that same visual game that I mentioned earlier, where we like being confused by what's on top of what. I'm doing sky holes last. So this the sky is a bit of an exception. It actually was there the whole time. You just couldn't see it, but I knew it was there. It just was underpainted in, 
in uh, orange, brown, which is the same color as what, what's left. Now, just another trick for what it's worth. I'm sure you're seeing this. Um, I just I just created an a top of that building simply by not painting the building, but by painting the blue sky. It costs quite a bit more paint when you add sky to half the canvas. Yeah, exactly, Femox. Good point, exactly. Um, so um, I'll see the rest of that comment when I go back on my computer. Sorry, I, co I couldn't catch it all. Uh, it, the, 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 it disappeared on me before I had time to get all the way through it. But thank you for your comments. I'll look forward to reading them later. Okay, so I just gave a definition to the top of a building, not by painting the building, in fact, but by painting the sky beyond the building. Does that make sense? And of course, it's got broken up by branches. Now, while I've got this color blue on my brushes, I think I'm going to play around a little bit with putting some reflection, at least in this window up here, the upstairs window, that would be catching the light of the sky behind the viewer behind us. Got it? This is a window, so we're seeing sky behind us. And let me see if I if I can't make it if I can't make it convincing, then I'll wipe it off and start over. But I think I think it's gonna work. Okay, excuse me folks, I'm gonna talk to my Man, Doug, that I mentioned a while ago, I got to keep broadcasting. What is it, Doug? I got the perch. Okay, you. Oh, good. Okay, so I need to go downstairs. Not right now. I'll order them later. Um. Thanks. Don't lose this switch though, because it's got the wires coming off of them, so I know the identification. Of what is it? Anymore. What is a switch? Is it something you took off the? Yeah, this. You know. Oh, the timer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I just need to know the orientation of those wires to put them in there. Did the, the man you talked to seem to think we'd be able to order a timer? Oh, he said you definitely can. Okay. Okay, good. Okie doke. Good. Now, that little bit of sky. It's looking just nice. a little bit. Like thank you. It's a little bit too pronounced, but maybe if I can fudge it out a little bit, we'll be okay. Uh, the pieces you were talking about for the gate for the pool, for uh, the table. Oh, yeah. Oh, where are they? That's the right one. Um, Give me each one more. There were two little bubble wrap packages. I think I dumped them in the wire basket, the wire. Or on the floor. On the floor, all the underneath all the shelves. <laughs> I think that's where they are. And there's also some of that um, stainless steel cable is also in that. I know that's where that is to, to fix the door and to fix the uh, my wow. easel. So these pieces that you got, will the, will the cable attach to that or do I need something to attach the cable to it? Do you follow me? And does the cable just loop through it and then you got to attach the cable? Yes, you just, else? you just, yeah. You're just making up for the easel? You're just making a loop at each end. For the door? Oh yeah, you would thread it through the eye hook and then just clamp it. it or whatever. No, or clamp it. Have some kind of clamp. That's what I bought. That's 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 the thing that I bought to is to clamp so it, the cables. That's what I was asking. It does actually clamp the wire. On itself. Yep. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'll be down as soon as I can get free here, I'll come down and make care make sure everything's okay. Working okay. Okay, so I've just got the pump running straight line. Yep, yep. Okay, so um, I'm going to mess up, as I do often, just mess up this blue a little bit. There, that's better. I'm going to set the parts down there by the computer in the dining room. That's what you'll be doing. Yep, right quick. correct. Great. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, man. Okay, um, now that I've done that, I go, wait a minute, I could probably squeeze in a tiny bit of 
sky reflection in that window. Just give a hint of window there. I think that'll do. Yeah. Okay, I'm nearly, nearly finished. Oh, you didn't see what I did there. Yeah, I guess you did. Okay, nearly finished with this painting. Um, I think I've gotten all the way through my list. Oh, I know what I need to do. Yeah, okay. Now, if you follow me often, you've heard this little speech before. So let me give it again for those of you who are not veterans. When Once you've entered, in my case, once you've entered the realm of opaque oil painting, which for me, the final edit is opaque, translucent opaque. Once you've entered the world. Now, if you're a traditional oil painter, then what I'm about to say applies to your whole entire process because you're painting in opaque colors the whole time. Here's what I'm about to say. Most of the time, and I'm going to zero in on the area I'm going to work on, this area, this railing that I, perhaps you watched me paint it just a little while ago. It's all the same color. It's all the same color gray. And more importantly, it's all the same value, light dark. It's all the same color value. Got it? So it's rather flat. Once you enter the realm of opaque oil painting, it's almost always, and not many things in painting you can say almost always, but this is one of them. Almost always a good idea to mix up a color, which is what I'm doing on my palette right now. Mix up a color slightly lighter, brighter, whiter, slightly paler, slightly lighter. Slight, the word slight is important. Slightly lighter than what's already there and come back and hit. Let's see if I've got the right color. Yep. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit more yellow to that. Naples yellow works well. And hit little bits and it almost doesn't matter where you put these little bits of light. I, I'm not. I'm not analyzing like what's bouncing off what where. No, it's. This is a. This is like a secondary or a tertiary or even a quaternary, <laughs> fourth degree light bounce in the scene. And by the time you get that far, everything's just way too chaotic for us to predict. So in other words, I, I don't expect the viewer to say, oh yeah, see that little bit of light right there? That's bouncing off X, blank. No, 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 I don't expect anybody to say that. Uh, so, But just by adding a little bit of light here and there and here and there, I'm, I'm making that, what was flat is now uh, interesting. Uh, one of a, a well-known teacher I've never taken from, but one of my friends, David Foster, took from Phil Stark quite a bit online, and Phil Stark calls it broken values. Another good term, just exactly what I'm doing right here. Um, all of that railing was one color. Now it's more than one color, and especially values. It's more than one lightness. I'm going to do the same thing to this part of the railing over here. See, all, all, this, all these marks are the same color. But if I just come in and hit little bits of it here and there, and it almost doesn't matter at all. Almost doesn't matter at all. That's another silly language. Forgive me. Um, it doesn't matter at all where you put these light marks. It's just that they're there. That's what makes the difference. Do the same thing on, I don't think, I think it's a little bit too light. So hang on. Let me do this. I'm doing this. So same principle repeated here. Here and there and here and there. Just wherever there's a color, especially this is true if there's any part of your painting that you had, you had a particular one color on your brush and you touched much of the canvas with that one color. This is where that, that's where this principle really comes in to, into play. Okay, now there is, there is two more things I want to do. One is, and I mentioned this was on my list, at the very beginning, it's this wall back here. There's a the third house back. This one here is a, it's a yellow wall. The house is painted yellow, and I do think the painting would look better if 
I painted it more or less the photo. Let me show you the photograph just for fun real quick. Do you see there's, here's one house, railing and pillar. That's all we can see, the close house, stairs, railing and pillar. House number two is the star of the show. House number three is this yellow one. And there's this wall right here and right here, pale yellow. And I do think that this would be a better painting if I brought some of that pale yellow and I'm almost running out of places to mix on this palette. Almost. Not quite. So I think I can go for just a few more minutes without doing a major scratch off. <laughs> without doing a major clean up of uh, my palette. But let me let me see here. First of all, if I can get the right color. Um, and in this case, right correct color does not mean the color that matches necessarily what's in the photograph. No, no, the right color is the color that looks good. Uh, that's like children. My, you know, grandchildren still like asking, Grandpa, what's your favorite color? And my answer is always the right one. An artist, in my opinion, an artist cannot afford to have a favorite color. That's just, <laughs> it's laughable to me. No, you better not have a favorite color. As an art, you're a really bad artist. And Sorry, in my opinion. The answer is the appropriate color is your favorite color in any given moment. Okay, so I've got this mixed up, and I'm going to be painting this now. A very careful um, translucent. Forgive me, I know some people have a hard time keeping these words straight. I don't, if I say all three words, I think you'll get it. And some people are just gifted at languages, some people are not. So those of you who are not necessarily linguistic, which is a number of artists who are not good at words, Transparent, clear like glass, right? Opaque, can't see through it like a wall, right? Translucent, it's the one that's left right in between. Fuzzy, okay, so, because a lot of people, they, they when they're talking to me, they, they want to talk about transparent painting and they use the word translucent because they feel like, I don't know, they get confused about which word is which. Anyway, at this point right now, very intentionally, I am definitely doing translucent painting. You can see through this yellow paint that I'm putting down. I'm trying to gauge and judge and, and control how opaque it is. Are you with me? There was a whole stroke. That's an unusual move right there. Basically a straight line. Human beings cannot draw straight lines, you know. That whole, that whole lecture, I'm not going to give that again. You'll hear it again if you haven't heard it before. If you follow me, you'll hear my straight line lecture. Human beings cannot draw straight lines without a ruler or a computer. I'm not going to give that lecture right now. Ah, here's a, here's a something. Good, I'm so glad I'm doing this. I just realized that the... The dark underside of this porch is not as good as it could be because it actually, that the ceiling of that porch ought to be catching quite a bit of reflection from all the light bouncing everywhere else. So I've just lightened that ceiling. Let me look at that and see if I like that better. That's a little bit of play of light, pretty subtle. But definitely, yeah, that is better. Same thing over here. I'm going to do the same thing right here. Yeah, that was a nice stroke right there. It's okay as an artist to say that this or that is a nice stroke. Um, again, I taught a five-hour painting class on Sunday. And if I could, I didn't say this at the time, but I could. And if any of you are watching from my class, if I could snap my fingers and fix one thing about most of my students, this is what I would fix. Are you listening? Stop saying bad things about your painting, about your painting skill, about your painting process, and about each and individual painting that you do. Stop, stop, stop. No. Stop saying those negative things. Um, that is the number one reason why people fail to progress as artists 
as quickly as they should. Ooh, I've never said that before. I'm going to say it again because it's true. The number one reason people don't progress as fast as they should is because they're too busy bad-mouthing their skill themselves and their paintings. So sometimes when you hear me saying good things about my painting, like, ooh, that was a good stroke, first of all, it's an, air, it's an expression of surprise. But also, I'm exercising, practicing what I preach, and I'm exercising good mental health. I say good things. I say regularly, I say good things about my painting. Now, that doesn't mean I'm clueless, and, and uh, I don't criticize myself. Of course I do. But way more praise than criticism. Way more. Way to go, Nelson. That was great. Of course I have moments, I, and I share them with you. I have many moments of, dang, that wasn't very good. Many moments. And if you watch me, you'll hear me. You'll hear me honestly say that. But way more praise, even from my own, you know, my own praise. Are you with me? I give myself credit way more than I give myself criticism. And if you want to be a better painter, you'll follow me in that uh, pattern of like you praise yourself way more than you criticize yourself and just about everybody listening to me needs to do that and hear that and receive that don't argue with me I am right about this one <laughs> well Mr. Dan what are the times that you <laughs> you say you're humble sometimes <laughs> uh <laughs> I'm right about this one. You need to say good things about your painting. I am so right about that. Deep down, most of you know it. Stop saying, I know it's just not very good. Hush. Don't be saying that. Okay, now, I, I, I'm not crazy about some, some, some of this yellow that I just did back here. So I'm going to take some of it off. I got, I got a little carried away, I think. I like I liked the roughness of the underpainting. Now, I like even better what I've in, ended up with here. Um, I love painting with a rag. Love taking stuff out. Okay, so I just did that. that um, yellow wall, right? Are you with me? And I believe I like it quite a bit. Um, there's only one more thing that I'm sure of that I'm going to do, and that is that um, this here, this here, <laughs> that there, that represents a, a window uh, underneath the porch. And I'm going to try to mix up a, a color to match this. This is, tra um, this is a combination of transparent layers of color, of course, but I'm going to try to mix up right now a, I'm going to try to match that in an opaque color. And by the way, what I just said is what most of what you do in the final painting stage is match what's already there. Okay, I'm pretty close. I'm going to darken it just a little bit more. I'm mixing on my palette. I'm sure, sorry I'm not showing it to you. Okay, on my palette knife now. I'm going to give definition to that edge. Oh, that's a little brighter than I wanted. Let me take a breath and, and stand back and look at that. See if I like it that bright. Hang on. I'm literally going to stand across the room. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's stronger than I had expected, but it 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 is okay. Now, same a little bit of the same color. I'm going to give some definition to this pillar here by painting around it. Um, okay, same thing now on this. Just a little bit of definition. Oh, I need to go the other way around. A little bit of definition here. Ooh, that might be enough, he says, and then instantly brings his brush. But look at how gentle I'm being with that brush. If I could, if I could zero in, there's some good painting right there. This represents a shutter. 
that's all I'm going to say about that shutter. Well, I'm going to do a little bit more. Um, down, down a little bit lower. Okay, I want you to watch this. I want to define this shutter just a little bit. Let me turn it into two shutters, actually. Are you with me? There. Uh, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, down lower. There. Okay, and then I'm going to soften that last mark. Just soften this edge of it a little bit. Okay, that's some good painting. That, my friends, is good painting. That whole panel right there. What is this dark triangle right there? The answer is, I don't know. I don't care. It's interesting. Our eye just begins to tell us, just barely tells us that this is like a shutter. Not a shutter. A shutter. <laughs> I don't shutter. I shutter the windows. Um, but it's it's messy enough. Uh, the, the, the immature impulse, if I may, the immature impulse right here would be to take this color, which is this color right here, and cover up that triangle. Look at how I'm holding the brush. And go, ee, 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 ee. Because your grumpy adult brain says, it doesn't make any sense. What is that? That's the grumpy adult brain talking. Do you understand? That is not your good childlike brain talking. The childlike brain goes, ooh, look at that. I hope I'm making sense to you. Now let's back out so you're not just seeing just that one little detail. I'm going to do the, I'm going to accomplish the same thing by walking across the room again and looking at that wall. Yes, magnifique, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I don't know if you heard me say the other day when I was teaching this class that I, I, I'm not smart enough, and I mean this quite qu literally. I'm not smart enough to do good painting. But I'm smart enough to see good painting when I see it, to spot good painting when I see it, and then to leave it alone. Okay? Another way to say this is uh, years ago, I discovered that the best painting happened while I was trying hard to do something else. Uh, Bob Ross's, by far, Bob Ross's best quote, happy little accidents. That is, that is good painting, is happy little accidents. Not things that you manipulate and control and force to happen, but things that happen quite beyond your control. You know what? Uh, i got to send a message to my wife. She just called in, and I not, can't quite interrupt. I'm going to take a, I'm gonna take a break here very shortly and get back to her. Right now, I'm just, by the way, with those strokes, I'm erasing some pencil lines. There's a little bit too much pencil right over here. So I'm just pushing it back. Ah, and then a little bit of this color of light hitting the tops of these stairs. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm off. I'm off the camera. Let's fix that. There we go. A little bit of light. So the same deep brown orange that I've got on my brushes right now is a good, good color for what I'm trying to do right now. Okay, I think I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I'm going to look at this painting. It'll it'll be it'll hang around the house for a day or two. Uh, this is I think the this the one. I think this is the fourth time I've painted this scene. That's because it, it's a scene that I use in my art classes. Have used several times in my art classes. That's why I've painted it so many times. Um, but there's no question to me that this is the best version of this that I've done. Um, I like it the best. So I'm going to uh, finish this broadcast right there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it was entertaining and instructive. If I didn't see your chat comments and if I didn't comment on them, please feel free to repeat your comments uh, in as a comment after the after the video is over and uh like i said i'll, I'll look at this for a few more days and then uh, ship it off to one of my galleries thanks guys for watching i'll be back again